welcome to our program. I'm Keith Tebow from FRC Media. Voters will be going to the polls on March 12th for a special recall election, and FRC Media is going to do our best to make sure you're informed about the issues and the candidates running in the race. I'm pleased to be joined by one of the candidates running in the recall election for mayor, Erica Scott Pacheco. Erica, thank you for joining us. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate thank having Thank you for coming having this opportunity to talk to the voters. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty simple to say that out of the five candidates on mm -hmm. the ballot, you may be the one that is, may not be as well known as others that have already mm -hmm. been in office in one way, shape, or form. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why you feel you're qualified to be mayor. Yes, uh, my name is Erica Scott Pacheco. I reside in the Flint neighborhood and I work downtown at a community organization serving Fall Rivers families, elders, and people with disabilities. I have 15 years experience in working in nonprofit fundraising and management, and I really see that public service experience as a great springboard to serving as mayor. Currently I serve as the director of development and I have a lot of executive experience that I think will empower me to be a mayor fighting for you, the people of Fall River. So what got you interested in doing this in terms of taking the leap and running for mayor? Um, in the, the climate that we're currently in. So I was a volunteer collecting signatures for the recall and I did that volunteering not because I knew many of the other volunteers, I knew some, but I've really been involved in our city as an activist protecting the Quickishan River Rail Trail, leading the advocacy to stop the sale of our drinking water to the Invenergy fracking plant because those are issues that are important to me as well as just showing up and being an engaged citizen. I've been to the majority of city council meetings over the last three years or so, and often voiced my opinion at Citizens Input. So when I heard from so many voters saying they wanted someone new, that they didn't know who that was, I decided to accept the challenge and run for mayor to represent you, the working families of Fall River. Now, as one of the five candidates on the ballot, I would think mm -hmm. four of you will be in favor of the first part of the ballot, which is asking the people to recall Mayor Correa. Why should he be recalled? Yes, that's correct. So on the ballot, there will be two questions. The first question is, you vote yes, hopefully. I'm asking for you to vote yes to recall Jason Correa. And the second question is, who will you vote for as mayor? And I ask that you vote for me, Erica Scott Pacheco. I think that Jason Correa is facing very serious charges and that it's very complicated uh, his defense strategy takes up a lot of time. And I also think, Keith, if it were you or me, I probably would have been let go from my job because I work with financial management and fundraising and money. I wouldn't be able to have indictments for uh, federal tax and wire fraud hanging over me. I'm not saying that he's guilty. Obviously, a court will decide that. But I think with these serious allegations, he needs to step aside. All right. So let's talk about some of the issues in the campaign, because mm -hmm. if that first part is successful, then the voters of Fall River are going to have to look at all five candidates mm -hmm. and see who they feel is best to take over as mayor of Fall River, even though there'll be another election sometime in, in the fall later this year. I, I, I want to get into some of the, the specific issues. Some of it you have expressed in a, in a, a, a flyer and an online um, a document that you have on, on your website. Um, but first, I want to get to a topic that has mm -hmm. been on this, the lips of a lot of people throughout the past three or four or five years. That is the pay-as-you-throw program. Mm -hmm. As you know, Mayor Correa, in late January, uh, decided to end the contract the city mm -hmm. has with Waste Zero for the infamous purple bags, which he says, in effect, ends the program. What are your thoughts about that? the mayor's action? What do you think about pay-as-you-throw? Should we have kept it? Your thoughts on, on the trash program? That's a really great question, Keith. I think that the way that Jaisal Correa ended pay as you throw was a mistake. Why? Because he did it unilaterally. He didn't work with the city council and we still have the ordinance for pay as you throw on the books. The mayor is supposed to be the chief executive of our city and absolutely should be enforcing all of our ordinances, not only cherry picking the ones that she or he wants to enforce and follow. Now, I initially was in favor of pay as you throw because I thought it promoted recycling which we can all agree is very important and a good way to lower the cost of our waste disposal. But as I researched it more, and as I heard from so many of you, the voters, I realized that there were three main problems with pay as you throw. First, it actually resulted in contaminated recycling. People, whether they intentionally or not, 
were throwing trash into the recycling and then we couldn't sell it as recycling. We had to throw it away as solid waste. And that's too bad because if the majority was recyclables, we still had to throw it away. Second was the lack of enforcement. So it was very uneven. Some people would boldly proclaim they had never bought a bag and that simply was not fair to people like you and me who were following the rules and playing by the rules. And third, the problem was the lack of education on how the program worked. Now at research pay as you throw in other cities, many other cities such as Brockton provide a lot more education such as having a sticker or a label on the bin saying the do's and don'ts of what is recyclable and what is trash. We never had that. We never had a real comprehensive educational part of pay as you throw and so many people were left with questions. Therefore, I concluded that the program had failed, especially when I heard from so many of you on fixed incomes and working families saying that it was a tr struggle to buy the bags, saying you would go to stores and they didn't have them. I experienced that too, and I know it was frustrating. So therefore, as mayor, one of my campaign platforms was to eliminate pay as you throw. I actually had it on that flyer, mm -hmm. the first draft of the flyer that you referenced, which you can see on my social media or on my website, erica4fallriver.com. Jaisal Correa kind of jumped the gun. It's very clear to me and to other voters that this was a desperate political move to get some favorable press and to get some uh, bonus points for keeping a campaign promise that he made three years ago and never fulfilled until now. And so therefore, in, if, if I were mayor, yes, I would keep the elimination, but I would work hand in hand with the city council because we need to work together. We cannot keep working against the city council. We cannot keep being at loggerheads with them. And I would work to eliminate that ordinance and I would collaborate with an environmental nonprofit to really do a strong educational campaign so that we can keep our recycling up and make sure it's not contaminated. Let's get to some other, other issues. Mm -hmm. um, some on this flyer, again, you can see that on Erica's website. Public safety, you want public safety and infrastructure together, but let's talk about public safety first. Okay. Um, how do you feel the level of staffing is in terms of our police and fire department? Would you look to increase staffing if you were? How would you mm -hmm. come up with the funds to do that? And also talk a little bit in terms of our public safety officials, not only the staffing issue, but ways to make sure that they have the tools be it in equipment and, and upgrades and facility upgrades to mm -hmm. make sure that they can do their job effectively. This is a really important issue because I hear from so many voters who are concerned about crime and do not feel safe. And I understand, I really do and I hear you and I will always listen to your opinions even if we don't agree. But this is an issue where I think we're all in agreement. I think that we need to make sure our public safety has the funding that they need. How are we going to do that? Well, for instance, the walking beat in the Flint, there's a, a space for it, but it's not happening right now. I spoke to some elders yesterday at a high rise, and one of them said that they only recently saw a police officer, or a female police officer, in fact, give a ticket in the Flint for parking in a do not park spot that was um, for, I don't know why it was a do not park spot, but first time in 13 years that he had seen that. I think we can all agree that there are many ordinances and laws that are not being enforced, whether it's parking or otherwise, because we don't have the capacity. I want to smartly use funding, especially our CDBG, Community Development Block Grant funding, from the Housing and Urban Development Agency, the federal agency, that funds walking beats, that will fund things to keep us safe. And in terms of the tools, one of the tools is not a physical tool, it's actually bilingual and multilingual language capacity. When I was making my platform, I spoke to police officers and SROs and heard that there is a need for more officers that speak other languages. We have some that speak Portuguese, but we have many other community members speaking other languages, and we need to be able to communicate with them and keep all of us safe. So that's something that I would focus on. I know that the Herald News also did a story last summer and it talked about the lack of language capacity in our police, fire, and emergency personnel. So that would be a priority for me too. So let me just ask you again about the staffing level. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the numbers of police officers and firefighters is sufficient? Uh, do, we, do you think we need more or do mm -hmm. we maybe just need to rethink how those officers are utilized in terms of minority officers mm -hmm. that can, that can in interact with members of our community? I think it's both. I think that we need to look at 
where folks are and I think that we need to listen to their needs and we do need to increase our levels to reduce crime. We have the opioid epidemic that is really threatening so many of our families and communities. I know that's a big concern to people. And also when looking at uh, language capacity, I just wanna be clear that people that speak different languages don't necessarily have to be uh, minorities or people of color. It's mm -hmm. just the language um, access itself that's so important. Right. You, you mentioned the opioid crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that that is uh, an issue of concern for many mm -hmm. people in this community and other communities across the country. Um, as mayor, what can a city actually do? Um, I, I mean, public safety-wise, there can, can be work in terms of prevent some of these drugs from entering mm -hmm. our region. But in terms of, of prevention and rehabilitation, what really can a city do? And as a mayor, how do you hope to address that issue? One thing that we can do and that I will do as your mayor is to focus on breaking these intergenerational cycles that we see. In my work, we see grandparents and even great-grandparents that we help get custody of grandchildren or great-grandchildren because several generations are affected by the opioid crisis. That's heartbreaking and it really just keeps the cycle going. And so what can I do as mayor? Well, a couple months ago I attended a training on starting a drug-affected um, drug children's alliance. There are alliances like this all over the country and the purpose of this training was to bring together folks from throughout all of Bristol County. So Fall River was there, Taunton was there. I really want Fall River um, public safety agencies, treatment, nonprofits, city agencies, housing, all of us to collaborate with a focus on keeping kids safe and breaking those cycles because we all know that kids do what they see and what they see they learn and then they perpetuate. And so we have to stop this cycle in its tracks, really focus on prioritizing kids' safety above all else. This model works. I was absolutely convinced of it at the training. Um, I was the only candidate there, and I was there completely convinced. They had um, about 400 people at Rachel's um, by the lakeside. Rachel's Lakeside mm -hmm. is called in Dartmouth on Route 6. And so I absolutely want to take leadership in that because I think it's a model that we're missing and that we need here in Fall River. Does a lot of that go back in terms of making sure that we provide the, the proper um, education and prevention early on in these children's lives in school? And is this something you can work with the school department on to, to get that information out? Yes, absolutely. The school department is a critical partner in this. And I believe in public education. My mom is a public school teacher. And I absolutely know that teachers are often social workers. My mom certainly is. And so I think working with the schools as well to keep kids safe and to break the cycle is critical. So let's get to education. You me we mentioned the schools. Um, what's your thought in terms of the proper funding of, of, our, mm -hmm. of our public school system? There's always to the talk about net school spending, how much we need to spend, and whether the administration goes above that. Mayor Correa has made it a point to to provide funding that's above the net school spending limit. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the funding of education and how can we make it more impactful for our students? School funding is a really critical issue for me. A lot of people celebrate meeting net school spending, but let's break down what that actually means. If we're meeting 100% of net school spending, it means we're doing the very bare minimum to pass. It's like getting a D minus. I don't think any of us would celebrate getting a D minus. It's not what your kids deserve. It's not what our city deserves. So therefore, I'm really gonna focus on exceeding net school spending. And right now, as we speak in the State House, there are there's advocacy efforts to change the school funding formula. I've been in support of those issues. There was a legislative event in Westport recently that the Fall River delegation was at and I attended and learned how we uh, as citizens can raise our voice and advocate to fix the school funding formula. And that's a state fix that I think probably will happen. But apart from that, as mayor, I'm gonna really focus on exceeding net school spending. I wanna make sure that teachers have what they need. Again, I, growing up, I saw my mom buying paper, buying pencils, buying crayons, buying supplies that the school should supply. I don't wanna focus on top-heavy administrative salaries. That's not what anyone wants. And so I will be a big advocate for education and educational funding as your mayor because I know the value of it. There was an unfortunate incident um, a while back with the passing of a student from the Fonseca School. Mm -hmm. 
and it led to a discussion which is ongoing in the school department, not only our public school department, but with Diamond Regional and our charter schools and our private schools over bullying and, and suicide prevention. Um, how do you see your role as, as mayor as helping to foster those discussions and sort of tangentially how to get parents more involved, not only in that issue, but the issue in, of their student, their children's education? Bullying is a major issue to me because I myself have been bullied. As a woman running for office, and even before running for office as an advocate, I actually acquired a stalker and had to get a permanent year-long uh, criminal harassment order because someone I did not know who was previously unknown to me began following me and my neighbors just as a result of my advocacy to protect our water. It was a very frightening situation, a very disturbing situation, and I felt powerless. I think that many parents right now feel powerless about the bullying that is going on in the schools. Fonseca School is in my neighborhood. I serve on the board of the Flint Neighborhood Association, although I am running for office not wearing my nonprofit hat. And we have many meetings at the Fonseca School, so I care about what's happening there. I care about the kids, and that's why I've been trying to support parent meetings about bullying. I really think that parents need a safe space to come together and share their stories and oftentimes that builds solidarity and really helps parents feel empowered to raise their voices because I do think for too long parents have been left out of the conversation. I saw that the city formed a task force to respond to bullying in light of this incident. My heart really goes out to the family that lost a child. My own family um, had an experience with a relative who completed suicide and so I don't know exactly what it's like, but I do have that personal experience to draw on, and I think it gives me empathy, and it makes me a fighter to make sure that mental health, that suicide awareness are raised. For so far too long, mental health has been stigmatized. Parents don't want to talk about it, schools don't want to talk about it, the community doesn't want to talk about it. And we see what happens when we remain silent. So I think that we need a lot of resources and support. There's a few issues, right? There's mental health, there's bullying, but what do we know about bullies? We know that bullies themselves often have very low self-esteem and may have experienced bullying or abuse at home mm -hmm. or in the school themselves. So we can't look at this as us against them. We're all in it together. And so as mayor, I absolutely am going to focus on promoting mental health awareness and ending the stigma because it's important to me and to my family. I want to get into some quality of life issues. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the top planks or the top plank on your flyer here has to do with housing. Yes. Um, you have been vocal about the um, lack of affordable housing, quality affordable housing in mm -hmm. Fall River. How would you attack that? I think this really is what sets me apart from my competitors is that I'm the only candidate who will be a champion of safe, affordable housing for people in Fall River. Now let me be clear, I'm not advocating what many people are afraid of. I hear many people say, we can't bring in more folks to Fall River. We don't want any more people coming from Boston, coming from Brockton, coming from other areas. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying people that live here, that work here, that built our city, who have kids here, who have grandkids here, never should be forced out of their city just due to the lack of affordable housing. That is something I'm absolutely going to champion. I know that Jaisal Correa is right now championing market rate housing. Now that's fine, we do need some market rate housing, we need to grow our tax base, but we cannot only focus on market rate housing. Many people wonder, what does that mean? That means apartments, lofts, $1,500, $1,600, $2,000 a month. I can't afford that and I don't think you can. What I'm saying is we need to be smart, we need to do mixed income private development. Mixed income means also including units for low and moderate income folks. 88% of our city are low and moderate income. I'm one of them. I'm considered moderate income because I make under $80,000 a year. And I bet you do too, because 88% of us do. So we need housing for the all, not just for the few. We need housing for the people already here, not just for those who are wealthy from outside the city who wanna come and live here. And so I'm focusing on affordable housing and I'm also focusing on enforcing the laws that we already have. The law, the ordinance on the books is that a city, um, multifamily homes are supposed to be inspected by the city every five years. Every five years, but yet we have many properties that have not been inspected in 10 years, in 15 years. I spoke to a voter recently who's what I call a good landlord. He has a multifamily home, he lives in it, he keeps it up, 
any money that he gets from rent, he largely invests back into his house. He pretty much breaks even. I know that taxes and fees are going up and it's very expensive. He told me that the city has not inspected his property in 13 years. That's not fair to people like him that are keeping up their properties while we have absentee landlords who are not. Mm. Bad properties attract bad tenants, create bad neighborhoods, and it becomes a cycle. I hear people say that Fall River is broken. Fall River is not broken. It's the system that is broken. For far too long, campaign donors, developers from out of town have really been taking advantage of Fall River. As your mayor, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to fight for affordable housing. I'm going to fight for sanitary and code enforcement. Where people live, very important, but mm -hmm. people need jobs. Uh, yes. Fall River still sort of falls behind the rest of the Commonwealth in terms of its unemployment rate being high. Um, that gets back to economic development, creating an atmosphere of, of businesses to invest in Fall River. What are your plans for economic development? Economic development and education, to me, go hand in hand because we can do economic development with good jobs, and by that I mean jobs that pay a living wage unless we stop the brain drain that's happening in our city. I love to do research because I really believe in facts and trying to use facts to advocate. So I did some research and I found that the Fall River metro area is last, tied for last in the country with Phoenix, Glendale, Arizona in terms of retention of kids who graduate. So less than one in three kids who graduate from a two and four year college from Fall River stay in Fall River. That's a huge problem. That's why as mayor, I'm going to start the Fall River Fellows Program. It will let students who are in two and four year colleges and trade schools get work experience, get internships in local businesses, nonprofits, city agencies. I know that DTA, AmeriCorps, there's some programs that already do this in the city, but there's no coordination. And so that's why as mayor, I'm gonna coordinate, I'm gonna do Fall River Fellows, and I'll take the first fellow in my office, working in the mayor's office as a way of keeping students here. Other issues with economic development, we absolutely need to be smart about giving out tips. I'm really concerned uh, about the spending in our city and how we get revenue or the lack of revenue when we give out tips. So that's why I'm gonna make sure we're smart about the companies that come in. For instance, Amazon was promising the median salary uh, of workers there would be like 35 or 36,000. We know that's not the case. Why is that? So when we're giving out tips, when we're enticing businesses, we need to make sure that they're paying good wages because too many people have to work two and three jobs just to pay the rent, and mm -hmm. that's not fair. A couple of other quick issues uh, before we wrap things up. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure, our roads yes. within the city. Um, that's always a bone of contention for people <laughs> who live here. We have a lot of roads in a city of our size. Uh, what are your plans in terms of upkeep and replacing and, and repairing our streets? So part of my platform links public safety and infrastructure. I really see them going hand in hand. I think that's a little different than any other candidate, but to me it's a no-brainer because we need a safe and we need a clean community. I've looked at the data um, from the state in terms of the condition of our roads, the condition of our sidewalks, where pedestrians are hit by cars, where bicyclists are hit by cars, where cars hit other cars. I've seen the map, it's a heat map, you can see hot spots around the city. We have the data. We're just not doing anything with the data. And so as mayor, a campaign promise that I absolutely will keep is doing a comprehensive citywide road repair and maintenance plan. It's not enough to repair, you have to also maintain. I was publicly opposed to streetscapes, to bonding almost $10 million for the different streetscapes projects. You paid for it, your tax dollars. I work in the completed streetscape of Purchase and Bank Street. There's been no new businesses that have come in. There's no new economic development. You paid for it. You paid for some plants, some nice lights, and a couple benches. I don't see the return on investment on that. And I see so many streets with potholes, with sidewalks that are impassable. Handicapped people have to walk in the street. Kids have to walk in the street because the sidewalks are impassable. It creates a very unsafe situation. We don't want to have school children getting hit by cars walking to school, as we recently had in Eastern Ave. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to do a comprehensive plan. And another promise that I will keep is I'm going to bring back the online reporting tool. There used to be a way that, and I did this myself, reported a pothole. Jaisal mm -hmm. Korea got rid of it. I don't know why, but my administration will be very transparent and accessible. And so I will bring back that tool so that you can report problems on your streets. City finances. Um, mayor has uh, boasted that, and, and he's got the facts behind him, that he has 
you know, uh, bolstered the city's reserve fund mm -hmm. uh, every year, the rainy day fund, as a lot of uh, mm -hmm. people like, like to uh, talk about. Um, what are your plans in terms of being fiscally responsible with people's tax dollars? What would be your criteria for raising taxes if there was a need to do so? So I'm a pretty fiscally conservative person. I think that my background in financial management and fundraising has empowered me to stretch a dollar three different ways. And so I think for too long, taxpayers in Fall River have been seen as ATMs. I'm opposed to unnecessary taxes and fees increases. I'm opposed to giving stipends and bonuses to my campaign supporters and to my friends. That will not happen with a Scott Pacheco administration. Anyone that I hire, anyone that I nominate for a board, I will make public their resume, and they need to be qualified with education or experience. These resumes already are public record, but right now, Jason Correa makes the media and citizens like you have to jump through hoops to get them through public records requests. I have nothing to hide, I'm just gonna put them out there so that you can see your tax dollars are being used wisely. I generally am opposed to Proposition 2.5 overrides. In fact, I have never voted in favor of one in my entire life. I will say that publicly and I will stand by that statement. That doesn't mean I never would support one, but as of yet, I have not because I think that we have those limits for a reason. I know so many tax taxpayers are really struggling with increased fees, increased taxes. That's gonna be a major concern of mine. You're not an ATM. I know that many people are struggling to get by, working class people owning a few properties. So how would you make those tough fiscal decisions um, in, in a year where if you feel as mayor, mm -hmm. um, even raising taxes up to the two and a half percent, you don't wanna do that. How would you make those difficult decisions and either cut, or cut back services or, or make it um, more efficient so the people of Fall River still get the services? I think there's ways that we can be smart and maintain the services. I don't want to cut services. What I want to do is cut the fat in administrative salaries and top heavy um, salaries and bonuses. That won't be happening with me. I'm not saying that I'm going to fire people. Frankly, I've done public records requests and I've gotten contracts for key staff members and positions and I'm still trying to figure out what my exact plan will be as the campaign goes forward and I'll keep everyone updated. Um, and I don't want to scare anyone that I'm going to come <laughs> in and fire people. I would never do that. I've been a supervisor. I've managed teams. And I think it's important to have um, a strong team that you work with and that you're clear about. But with that said, everyone that works in City Hall is paid for by your dollars. And that's really important to keep in mind. Some things specifically, you mentioned about the rainy day fund. Yeah. I really question... I know that there is money in there, but I question, are we just like hoarding money that should have actually been spent? For instance, a very concrete example. The library is in really poor condition. Mm -hmm. The roof is leaking. I think we all saw the pictures of a tarp trying to keep out the rainwater. And now Jaisal Correa wants to use Community Preservation Act funding, which is your tax dollars. It's from the tax, um, the tax levy. He wants to use that to fix the library. Why have we not been using the rainy day fund to fix the library? Because that's a basic maintenance part. I do not agree with using CPA funding. I don't think that's the purpose of CPA funding, to fix the library. That's something that we need to keep up. Just a few minutes left. First of all, thank you for joining us again. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Where can people find out more information about your campaign as they prepare to vote on March 12th? You can look me up on Facebook, Erica Scott Pacheco. You can also visit my website, erica4fallriver.com. It's the number four. Uh, my cell phone is out there. I'll it, I'll say it, 508-821-6008. You can feel free to call me, and I'm making myself very accessible. And I really look forward to meeting you as the campaign goes on and hearing your concerns. I can't promise that I will do anything except listen to you. I'm not here to make promises I can't keep, but I can promise that I hear you, I will listen to you, and I will represent you. And that's why I ask for your vote on March 12th. Erica, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you, I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. That'll do it for this edition of our program as we prepare you to vote on March 12th. So please, make a point to vote on March 12th. That's a Tuesday coming up in just a few weeks. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for joining us.